All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining me after lunch. Uh, I'm not Yanks. Yanks will be speaking shortly. Uh, I, uh, I will be speaking for the next 20 minutes. So, uh, Tales from Forest, an alternative Filecoin client. What are all those? What do all those words mean? Um, well, uh, in 2020, uh, Filecoin awarded a grant to Chainsafe uh, to work on a uh, Filecoin client in Rust. And so there's, uh, there's Filecoin, there's Chainsafe, and there's Forest. And I am just this little guy. Uh, I've been working on Forest for about six months. Uh, I come from a relatively traditional software development background, uh, and I'm new to the world of Filecoin. So this talk will be uh, a ground up technical introduction to Filecoin uh, for the curious. This is what I wish I had had when I was starting the job. A lot of these concepts I didn't get until a couple of months ago. Uh, as we do that, we're going to cover Forest uh, and see how it manages the particular technical problems and implementation details and how that has opened up new use cases uh, for the Filecoin ecosystem. So uh, why, did, why did Filecoin commission Chainsafe for Forest in the first place? Well, it was part of their client diversity uh, initiatives. So why bother? Why bother with another implementation? Well, client diversity is often the sign of a healthy specification. Uh, and it helps to drive an ecosystem forward. So that's Internet Explorer. And there was a time where Internet Explorer was a monopoly over the web ecosystem. And the web didn't really progress. But once you have a plurality of clients, web browsers are then incentivized to standardize. Another reason why client diversity um, is great is it provides a partition for security vulnerabilities. So last month, you may have heard about this uh, rapid reset attack that led to the biggest uh, DDoSers in internet history. Uh, and this was a bug in uh, many implementations of HTTP2. Um, and for example, Go was affected, but, uh, or Go's standard library implementation of HTTP was implemented, but not Hyper, which is Rust's library. And that's an example of having multiple implementations means that when a security vulnerability happens, um, it doesn't affect the entire network. This also exposes the ecosystem to different uh, attitudes on security. So Forrest uh, is, is keen on fuzzing. That's something we're going to do in the near term. We're already quite big on property testing, for example. Sometimes your diverse clients, they write useful stuff. So uh, the Forest team at Chainsafe wrote the built-in actors, and that is a part of every running uh, uh, FEM implementation at the moment. Also, re-implementation is kind of the ultimate code review. Um, uh, there's a, a lot of stuff that may be under spec. Uh, and we in Forest have had to document where we feel the existing documentation is lacking. So here are a couple of pull requests. And a lot of them are just diagrams and documentation. The, the, the gold standard is something like this. This is the HTML spec. Um, if you're implementing a web browser, you don't need to read any of Chrome's source code. You don't need to read any of uh, Safari's source code. You can go straight from the spec. But Filecoin spec is currently incomplete. You have to go to Lotus, which is the gold standard reference implementation. OK, so uh, another reason why we want client diversity is think of your text editors. If you're just reading, uh, you might use less, doing some simple edits, nano. Uh, if you hate yourself, you'll use core utils. Uh, if you're editing code, maybe you want a different editor. Um, and we can foster a similar set of tailored use cases in the Filecoin ecosystem. So for example, this is Venus. Venus is specialized for mining. They have a new concept of like mining pools, storage pools. Uh, and we see Forest as a specialization uh, on uh, right now on the archival node use case. OK, so I promised uh, uh, the talk I wish I'd had when I was learning how Filecoin works. So 
Let's start with IPFS. IPFS is a content-based addressing system. It targets medium to web scale file storage. Uh, so every file gets a magical unique ID. Um, and you just ask a decentralized network, give me this file. But you still get problems. You get problems like this. Uh, oh, like with Git, I, I can't find that file. Or even on, on Filecoin, trying to browse some of the uh, Filecoin improvement proposals, you'll get a 404 because those files may have existed at one point, but they don't anymore. Uh, and whenever something like that happens, it's a, it, it might be an incentive problem. So no one's getting paid to host files on IPFS. That's where Filecoin comes in. Uh, we will pay you to keep the data up, and we will fine you uh, if you don't store the data for a year when we asked you to. Um, Filecoin has a blockchain. This is a decentralized way for everyone to agree on important information. So that is, who is paying who to store files? Who has agreed to store files and for how long? And how can storage providers prove that they've stored the files that they said they will? Um, and this is the so-called proof of replication and proof of space time that, uh, that you may have heard about. I'm proving that I've stored your childhood photos for a year. Um, OK, cool system. How does that work under the hood? Enter the FVM, the Filecoin Virtual Machine. This is a virtual CPU that can run actors. Um, actors are small programs, and they combine uh, data. So here I've, I've, got a, I've, I've got a simple to-do actor, and it's got some data, which is a list of to-dos. And then you have things you can do with the actor. You can add items. You can add to-dos. You can remove to-dos. You can act actually do execute the to-do list. And so this is, this is a few concepts. Um, first, actors can change their own state. So if I'm the Filecoin virtual machine and I'm asked to add uh, a, an item to this list of to-dos, the, the actor will change its internal state. Or when I'm executing the to-dos, maybe the actor will communicate with other actors. Um, OK, so writing the logic like this add item, remove item, stuff like that, that's done in like a programming language. Um, maybe it's in WASM. Uh, that will be coming shortly. But how do we store the state of these actors? Hmm. If only there was some kind of system for storing data. Ah, IPFS. We're already using IPFS, and that's what uh, actors uh, use as their storage. So what is, what is this data? Well, it's a bit like JSON. Uh, if you're familiar with JSON, you have a few core data types. You have strings here in yellow, uh, numbers in blue. You have mappings. So these are dictionaries from, say, foo maps to the number one. But you also have this interesting type, this red one here, which is a link to another document somewhere. So just like all of our files are content addressed, each of these IPLD blobs are addressed. So this, this one points to some other JSON somewhere. And we also have lists here in green. So how might this work? Well, let's go back to our to-do actor. It's got uh, a list of to-dos, 1 to 10. Um, and I might call the add item method. And it mutates its internal state. And suddenly, it's gone from having 10 items to uh, 11. OK, so what is that blue arrow then? That blue arrow is actually the blockchain message itself. So once you know all of the messages that the actors want to execute in order, then you have all the information you need to build up your blockchain state. Um, and so we can see this partition here. On the left, we have the messages. And on the right, we have uh, the state of the world. At the moment, this virtual machine is, only has one actor. but in, in the real world, there are, there are hundreds, maybe uh, well, tens, uh, up to uh, a custom number of actors running on the virtual machine. OK, fine. So that's some of the basics. But notice at the bottom here, we're duplicating a lot of the data. So the state one and the state two, after we've added an item, uh, like the first 10 items are the same. 
And when we're doing this kind of computation, you don't want to store that because, you know, that's the equivalent of, of saving a new copy of uh, a Word document every time you edit it. Um, it's not sustainable. Can we think of something else? Well, going back to uh, how IPLD works, we can share data with our past selves. So our current state uh, can reference the previous state. It can say, hey, for the first 10 items, just look in the past, and it will provide you a link to that data. In fact, theoretically, you can share data with all other actors. This was something that took me ages to understand, but luckily we have uh, David on the team who's written a uh, Haskell compiler, and these kinds of persistent immutable data structures are very common in the functional programming world. Um, and Josh, another one of my colleagues, has been working on documenting a lot of this. Like we said, the, the Filecoin spec is a little bit underdocumented, um, and uh, Josh has been working on some fantastic work actually explaining how reaching into the past works, um, as you can see in this diagram. Okay, so um, Filecoin clients, they take messages. Um, as an aside, messages are grouped into things called epochs. Uh, it's not really important right now. There have been about three million epochs and way more than three million messages so far. And every Filecoin client will take these messages and execute them against these internal actors and check that, oh, okay, the, the, I agree with the rest of the world on what's happened in Filecoin. I, I agree that, you know, Hubert has agreed to store uh, my MP3s for 10 years. Um, fine, so if we're going to be an alternative uh, Filecoin client, we have to get the same answer as everyone else on the network. How do we do that? Well, there's only one uh, Filecoin virtual machine at the moment, so we just use that. And you can think of this a bit like uh, Microsoft Edge and Google Chrome being basically the same, they've got the same engine under the hood. Um, but while these browsers are basically skins of the same thing, um, Filecoin clients do a lot more. They uh, have 21 different execution environments, for example. You see here, there are, there are three different versions of the FVM. Um, clients will manually implement those FIPs that I mentioned earlier. Um, so there's a lot of room for stuff to go wrong. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we verify we've done the right thing? Well, we already have the source of truth, right? On, on, on the right-hand side, we, we, we have the historical data. So we can just check, hey, did we get the same answer as the rest of the network? And once we have guaranteed we've done that, um, then we can say, okay, Forrest is correct. Um, Okay, that's fine. So, so we've got about three million epochs. That's plenty of data. We should be able to really robustly test Forest from epoch zero to the present day. Um, and I mean, the network has this data, right? We can just ask. So, hey, does, does any, anyone on the Filecoin network right now have the messages from a million epochs ago? Let's, let's ask them over the, the, the gossip protocol. No answer. Turns out that most Filecoin clients only have the most recent, I don't know, like 2,000 or so messages. And that's, that's the most you need to actually keep track of, uh, uh, of executions. So there must be some other way other than asking our peers about uh, what messages are current. That's where car files come in. Car files are simply files that are a list of those messages and their content IDs. Um, and they're, they're, they're very simple, and they're often used by nodes when they're bootstrapping. So when you're first starting, uh, when you're first joining the network, you will download a snapshot, and then you have enough context to start executing messages for yourself. All right, so let's go find some car files that have all the historical data. Um, couldn't really find any, at least not accessibly. So for, su for, for such a core, like, uh, open set of data, this is really hard to get. There is a team over at the main Filecoin project um, 
called Sentinel that, uh, that have this data. But one, uh, so, so they host it on, on Google Cloud, um, and they're, they're, they're not charging any fees for this service, but Google Cloud will charge you egress fees for downloading uh, this data. And it's about 40 terabytes, which is huge. Um, so, um, well, we, we need this data for testing. So uh, we at Chainsafe, we just went ahead and downloaded all that data. And we've hosted it uh, free of charge on uh, Cloudflare so that if you want to do similar testing, um, you can just get it with, without egress fees this time. And so here we see we're going all the way back to epoch zero. Um, and eventually we're going to host this data itself on IPFS. So you should be able to just grab it from your local node. So I mentioned 40 terabytes earlier. That's a huge amount of data. Why, why is it so much? Um, well, part of it's how to do with how snapshots are managed, especially in Lotus. So here we see the snapshot size growing over time. Uh, there was a bug, uh, NV16, that was fixed in NV19. But in general, the trend is upwards, which means that if you want to grab this data, you're downloading the area under the curve. But I, I just mentioned that there's a lot of duplicate data in the blockchain history, no? If I, if I take a snapshot at the blue arrow and a snapshot at the orange arrow, a huge amount of that data will be uh, the same. So can we take advantage of that to, to drop our data requirements? And it turns out uh, we can. And so Forrest has come up with the concept of diff snapshots, which is where you only store the new data. And if you need to build up a, a new snapshot, you can take a regular snapshot like this blue arrow here, just add the diff to get to the orange arrow. And so the graph for those file sizes looks like this. And so we, we cut uh, a 40 terabyte corpus of data down to 20 terabytes. So 20 terabytes of free uh, archival data, fantastic. As an aside, let's talk about how we generate those snapshots. Um, so Lotus currently takes you know, almost 200 gigs to generate a snapshot. These are huge machines, um, whereas Forest uh, takes about 10 gigs. This is because when re-implementing how to yeah, generate snapshots, we, we, we did things a little bit differently. So for example, we, we were lazy a lot of the time. Uh, Hubert's smiling as if I've just told a lie. <laughs> um, Okay, I, I, may, I may amend myself in the comment section. Um, but a lot, a lot of the ways we do that is um, by being lazy uh, and only using, only allocating data when we absolutely need to. Okay, so we have our historical data. Now let's load it into a database. Uh, not so fast. If you try and load 20 terabytes of IPLD data into Lotus, into Forest, you're going to run into trouble. Like, it doubles your disk usage. It takes a huge amount of resource. Um, we really needed a better solution. And David came up with this idea of, rather than taking your snapshot file and then loading it into the database and then giving that database to Forest, why can't we just, like, go straight from the file to Forest? And so we... Uh, uh, and we introduced like forests.car.zst. This is a backwards compatible file format. Um, and it turns out this idea of making this shortcut is so good that uh, the folks over at Filecoin already came up with it. Uh, it's called carv2. But forest sticks with uh, forest because it also is compressed. So uh, this halves the size of a forest snapshot while still giving you the uh, speed that you need for, for randomly accessing this data. Uh, and for us, definitely, we want to merge this in to the car standard uh, so that, yeah, lots of archival users can share this use case. OK, so we can halve our snapshot import times. And we could make a, an archival node out of this, no? We have everything we need. We have low overhead uh, archival storage. Uh, we have a, a, a very low uh, resource node. And so that's what we've done. This is uh, Archie, the archival node over at Forest that 
me and David were building, and it is uh, going to be, it's, it's a private node right now, but we're going to be opening it up in Q1 of next year. And you can go ahead and join the archival beta here. Uh, and that's not it for Forest. We're now going to set our sights on uh, better defining the Lotus JSON RPC API. Uh, again, it's suffering from similar issues in terms of underspecification. Um, and that's it. I've been Atif, and thanks for listening to my talk.